Mr. Foreman. Slow down the assembly line. I say, please, Mr. Foreman. welcoming Marvin Serkin here and allowing me to introduce him. So I'm a doctoral student with Andrew and I also work for the French publisher who translated Marvin Serkin's and Dan Georgicus's book on uh, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers in Detroit. So um, Marvin... I would give him the title in French. The title in French of the book is Des Trois Pas d'Aptors pour Crever and was published in uh, last April. So Marvin Serkin is a um, professor of comparative urban studies and policies at the University of Long Island. Um, and he's a specialist of social change in urban politics. He wrote his first book back in 1975. Uh, so the book we're going to talk about today, uh, Detroit, I Do Mind Dying. He uh, wrote it with Dan Georgicus, who couldn't make it to France today. Um, so maybe I'm gonna talk a bit about the book before Marvin starts. Uh, basically it talks about the rise, the birth, the rise, and the ultimate demise of a group called the League of Revolutionary Black Workers in Detroit which seek to organize black workers in the auto industry. So it started as um, grassroots unions in the different union, uh, different auto factories in Detroit, and then uh, became this sort of more uh, encompassing political organization. So Marvin today is going to talk about logics of race and class in America and in Detroit, and more specifically about the legacy of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. Okay, thank you very much, Clément. Merci bien. And thank you to Natalie and to Andrew. Let's, let's just put it over here. This will be better. Is that better? Thank you to Natalie and to Andrew and to uh, wonderful university. I'm very happy to be here. It's my first time uh, getting just inside from the Place de Sorbonne where I was, have been many times, but not inside the university. So it's uh, uh, a pleasant uh, opportunity for me. And uh, this is, an, I've been giving this speech or some variation of this uh, presentation for, it seems like, forever, for a very long time. And uh, it's, it seems like with the new French edition that just came out this spring, uh, they did a very excellent job of tra translating the book. And the relatively new, it's published in 2013, third American edition, English. There's also an English edition that was published from the second edition that was published in England. Uh, it's, there seems to be, with the new generation of young people, a new generation of uh, people who are interested in seeking ways to make social change, uh, and are looking to, for examples, uh, historical examples, uh, positive examples, any kind of successful examples of people who have been organized and making efforts to bring about uh, change in the, in the capitalist world, in the advanced industrial world, in the post-industrial world, in the de-industrialized world, which I have recently gotten a very good picture of in, uh, in the banlieue of Paris and in, uh, and in areas of Liège in Belgium, uh, as well as what I'm familiar with, of course, in Detroit and elsewhere. So this book deals with this particular phenomenon, this particular history of a group and several different groups of people who attempted to uh, do something which they said 
they, they did not mind working. And there's a song which goes along with the title of the original title of this book, which was Detroit, I Do Mind a Dying. It comes from a, a, a blues song by a, an African-American uh, blues, uh, African-American uh, assembly line worker who was a blues singer and musician after hours after work. And he wrote the song, which we found and, and transcribed, uh, called, which goes like this, please Mr. Foreman, uh, slow down the assembly line. I say, please Mr. Foreman, slow down the assembly line. I don't mind working, but I do mind dying. And we found that it was a, a, among a, a whole variety of phenomena that were going on in Detroit in the late 60s, early 60s, into the late 60s and early 70s, uh, the relationship between uh, blues culture, between the Motown sound, which developed at, in the city of Detroit, and the political phenomena of organization at the point of production in the factories, in the communities, in hospitals, schools, and elsewhere, were related phenomena. And so when we titled the book Detroit, I Do Mind Dying, we had in mind looking at a phenomenon of how the politics of working class people, and in this case predominantly African American or black working class people, and the phenomenon of cultural creation, cultural development is related. So we're looking at the, the politics of culture and the culture of politics. And we so, and, but then we also said the subtitle of the book is A Study in Urban Revolution, because the people who were engaged in wildcat strikes in Detroit at the factories of Chrysler and Ford and General Motors, the big three automakers, uh, they claimed that what they were doing was not only trying to reform uh, or have influence in the company, in, in the business of making cars, have influence or reform of the uh, unions of which they were affiliated with and in which they felt in many cases they felt discrimination and that they were not uh, fully represented by their own unions uh, and the state or the government or the political structures institutions of society they felt that what needed to happen was not only to look for processes and forms of reforming these institutions but actually of transforming them and of creating a revolution. So they talked about a, a black revolution. And uh, interesting, at, the at this time in the, in the United States, if you look at the 60s, and in some ways I say this, this book will give you, if you read it, you, you'll get kind of a bird's eye view of what the entire phenomenon of the 60s was, at least from the perspective of the United States. Of course, there were things going on in Europe and uh, in, in Italy, uh, and 68 in Paris, in, in Mexico and other places, but a bird's eye view of the American version of the 60s phenomena. A student movement, a movement against the war in Vietnam, a, a nationalist movement in which blacks were, were raising their fists and, and at, calling for black power, uh, movements like the Black Panthers, the Black Muslims, civil rights movements like those led by Martin Luther King and by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and other organizations that were attempting to uh, change voting rights, have more participation and more acceptance and more equality among uh, the African American population in the country. And uh, along with the, all those movements, and of course feminist movement, women were beginning to say we've had enough and uh, having organ new organizations of women who were addressing the issues of women's representations and women's equality or, and issues related to inequality of uh, women as well. And all of these movements in some way or another merged in the city of Detroit in some ways unlike any other place in the United States at this time. Uh, so the Black Panthers had some representation in Detroit. The uh, civil rights movement was represented in some ways in Detroit. Uh, there was an, uh, a movement to do something which was called the Black Manifesto, which was an effort to have a redress grievances since the time of slavery for those injustices that were done to the black population, the African American population, and get uh, redemption for those for those uh, 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 abuses. 
There was also, growing out of this phenomenon in Detroit, there was also uh, an organization which was an attempt to make a national organization beyond the city of Detroit and beyond the auto industry of something that was called the Black Workers' Congress, which was going to be a, an amalgam of a number of different African-American-based organizations to create a wider presence throughout the country and ultimately have some kind of contact with, which they did, in fact. Uh, the Detroit people had contact with the auto workers in Turin, Italy, that, who were protesting and on strike many, many times during the period of the 60s. They had influence and interest in the uh, movements of the, uh, and the problems of the Palestinians in their disputes with, in Israel and the Middle East. And there were contexts of a variety of forms like, of that sort. And so you see, if you look at it, in Detroit, here you have a movement which is led by black people, which is led by black people who are predominantly and have started their experience of being workers at the point of production in these large assembly line factories, and who say, what we need to do is we need to unite, we need to be led by blacks as the most oppressed elements of the, of the working class, and we need to unite race and class phenomena in order to make the new American Revolution. Wow, <laughs> what a big charge. And as you might be in some ways surprised, and, and one reason I think that why this book has sort of continued to have some kind of use and credence over this course of some 40 odd years, and now with new publications, it's people are wanting to look at it and think about these issues again, is because there was not only this big idealistic sounding uh, goals and strategy that was being developed uh, right out of the factories themselves by these very workers themselves, not led by intellectuals and not led by professors and not led by you know, people like Andrew and me and, and uh, my good friend Clément, but were led by, by assembly line workers themselves. Uh, <clears throat> and so the question is, what, how could they take on so much, and what did they do with these big ideas, with these tremendous ideals, with these big objectives? How far did they get? And what the story uh, uh, conveys is that over a relatively short period of time, roughly about from 1968 to 1971, 72, so a period of roughly about three or four years, there were some very impressive uh, successes that the organization had in a range of different activities. Uh, and of course, these are accounted for. And you say, well, gee, they really were incredibly successful. How did they do that? Well, they had some strategies. And the strategies were, were not strategies that were primarily or oriented to be opposed to things. They were in some ways opposed to the company, to the corporations. In obvious, in some ways they were opposed to their own union, which they felt very often was in bed with the companies and was being more supportive of the interests of the white workers or more supportive of the interests of the, of the managers and the corporate executives and, and stockholders than they were of the interests of the workers themselves. Uh, <clears throat> but they developed strategies that were oriented towards a positive perspective. In other words, they believed that their goal was revolution. They believed that it doesn't happen in a day. But they also believed and they developed their strategies in such a way that they said that we can teach ourselves and the people we represent that this is possible if we can have some successes. And success means gaining power. If you are powerless, success definitely means gaining power gaining influence, gaining, gaining an upper hand in a particular situation, and being able to score with that, being able to carry forward that, uh, that uh, effect beyond just a momentary uh, happening. And so the book recounts a number of examples of these particular, uh, what I would call particular successes or positive efforts to, to assume power, to take power uh, in, in uh, places where they lived and worked. And I'm gonna tell you about a, a couple of examples of these things. Uh, one, I think I'll just uh, start with one story. We started the book with a story about a black assembly line worker who 
was working at a factory of the Ford, uh, of, not Ford, but of Chrysler Company called Elrum, the El, uh, Eldon Gear and Axle Company. And this was reputed to be one of the dirtiest, most dangerous, noisiest, uh, and pushy uh, fast line, fast assembly line factory in the entire city, in the entire system. And this worker, relatively young guy, I can't remember how old he was, but he was probably somewhere around his late 20s, early 30s. He had come, like a lot of the, the black workers and a lot of all the auto workers, the white auto workers as well as the black auto workers, he came from an immigrant experience. So there is an immigrant story that gets involved in, in Detroit as well, and certainly throughout America, which may have some resonance with what's going on in France and what's going on in Europe nowadays. <clears throat> And like many of the black workers, uh, he had come up from Mississippi, come up from the Mississippi Delta, come up from the South, from a rural background, from a relatively uh, non-excessively literate background, and come to Detroit for the experience of you know, moving ahead, getting, gaining the American dream, being successful beyond what was possible uh, in the dying areas of cotton production in the, in the rural areas of the South, where of course had been exceeding, uh, segregation and discrimination and so on. And James Johnson was unmarried. He was, he was a homeowner. He was living with his mother and his, his sister, I think it was his sister, uh, in Detroit. And he's working on the assembly line at this noisy, dirty, uh, smelly factory. And it's about 10 minutes to three in the afternoon, and he is about to uh, go home at the end of his shift of work. And the foreman comes up to him and says, no, it's not time to go home for you. There is what they called, and it was part of the contract, forced overtime, mandatory overtime. And there was no excessive time given to him to, to tell him that he was going to be working overtime. So he he's, was forced to stay and work beyond his full shift of work. Of course, he would be paid beyond the full time of pay because it was an overtime situation. Well, he was pissed off, angry, and he left the factory. And he went home, and he got his rifle, and he came back to the factory. And he killed the foreman. And he killed two other workers. And so he was, he's on trial now. He's on trial for murder. And the defense team, because of, of all the strategies, many different strategies that the League of Revolutionary Black Workers had developed, there was a legal strategy. There was an auto defense, self-defense strategy. There was a legal strategy. And they had a legal team. And one of the people of the legal team was a, 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 a quite a well-known guy at that point, was named Ken Cockrell, who eventually became a city councilman and eventually became a candidate for mayor of the city of Detroit. And he was, a, he was at that point considered to be the leading candidate to become mayor of the city. And he had had a background of being also, he was born in Detroit, but he had a background from the previous generations of people from the South, family from the South. And he had been an assembly line worker before he went to law school and got a law degree and now was a defense lawyer. And he's part of the team that's defending James Johnson, who's up for murder. So can you imagine what happened? How do you turn a situation like that into a power play? I'm going to take power against the company and against the union and against the state because I'm building a revolution. And my legal strategy has to be consistent with building this revolution. Well. What they did, they, they figured out a rather coy and unusual uh, tactic to go along with the strategy of winning. And the tactic was that uh, what led to the temporary insanity, if you understand about American legal system, you can be uh, guilty by reason of temporary insanity and then instead of going to the electric chair or getting some kind of a nasty injection that will kill you and, or staying in jail for the rest of your life, you will just be sent to a mental institution for rehabilitation. 
So this is one way of people avoiding ultimately staying in jail the rest of their life in something like a charge like murder, which was the case of James Johnson. So that they determined that what led to the murder and to the temporary insanity, which and the murder of James of these people, was the conditions at the factory, the noise, the uh, push, the rush of the of the assembly line, the uh, dirtiness and messiness of the assembly line. In fact, there had been, they were able to demonstrate that there had been a number of accidents just in the weeks preceding this incident because of oil slicks on, on, the, on the floor of the factory. Uh, and so there was a number of accidents and people were injured, black workers were injured. So they, they said, well, how are we going to show the jury which is going to, of peers, which is going to determine the guilt or innocence of this man, how are we going to, how are we going to prove to them that he's guilty by temp, reason of temporary insanity caused by Chrysler Corporation? Seems obvious once you see, once you hear the story. I bet nobody would give, be able to say, give an example what they could do. If you had, if you read the book, you would know. But if, if you have it, how could you guess what could they do? So what they decided to do was they decided to take the jury to the, to, the, the, uh, to the factory. Obviously, how are they going to know that the conditions could be so bad that they could lead to somebody going in temporarily insane? And on top of it, being pushed to work extra and be pushed, forced to work in these conditions. So they took the jury, and this was unprecedented, an historic achievement for a defense team to take the jury out of the courtroom to the factory and show them the conditions. Well, the upshot is that they won the case. And he was, he was convicted of temporary insanity. And ultimately, in a subsequent trial, he won workman's compensation for the time that he had lost on the job during the trial and during the subsequent period leading up to the trial and, pre and post-trial. So this was an unheard of, in a sense, victory at a way of really using the legal system to gain power for people who were previously in, disempowered or powerless. So that's one example. <clears throat> Another example, which I like to suggest to you, is that we've talked, I, I mentioned a little bit without really giving too much examples, I gave an example of a song, but without giving too many examples, I gave an example of uh, some cultural uh, aspects of this movement. Well, they understood, and this was in many ways very contrary to other uh, political and social movements of the period, which attempted to become like, like the Black Panthers. And if you haven't seen it, there's a new movie about the Black Panthers, which talks about how they were became uh, so popular uh, and became such a uh, used and were using the mass media to get their story out and, be, and grew very quickly because the media took on the Black Panthers and spread the word. And so they were, it, the word was going all over the country and really in many ways all over the world, people heard about the Black Panthers. But they didn't hear much about the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. Perhaps because it was a workers' organization, because perhaps it was in auto, because, perhaps because it was in Detroit. <coughs> in any case, uh, <coughs> They understood that if you were going to uh, address people politically and socially, you, need, you could do this with cultural phenomena like music, like films. So they had book clubs. They made a movie called Finally Got the News. Uh, they were involved in making a movie. And they also uh, wrote a newspaper, which they published and put out. And they understood that if you were going to publish a newspaper, which was going to be distributed and part of a way of building propaganda and building your movement, getting people to follow you for demonstrations or for strikes or for just information about what your movement was all about, you needed to not only have a newspaper and books, but you needed to have a, a publishing uh, arm and you needed to have a printing press because if you didn't, you had to buy the services from somewhere else. And if you bought the services from someplace else, one, you had to have the money to do that, but secondly, you would, you would need to uh, depend on those outside institutions of having some leverage 
or control over your production. So the best way to do it, which is exactly what they wanted to do in the factory, the people working at the point of production should own or should have some degree of control and leverage over that which they're producing, which they didn't have, which is why they're complaining, which is why they were protesting, which is why they were demanding a revolution. Well, the same would be true about if you're going to have a newspaper. One, you had to figure out how to write the news, the news for the newspaper, but second, you had to do how to print it. Then you had to figure out how to distribute it. And they, they were aware of those things. So they, be, they really developed, began to have a vision of how to do those kinds of things which would really empower them. And self-empowerment, obviously, is a form of power. But using power that exists in the state, as they did with the use of the jury system, was one way. Well, one of the things they did with newspapers, there was a, uh, the largest state university in Detroit is called Wayne State University. Of course, the county is called Wayne County. The university is called Wayne State University. And uh, one of their main leaders, a man by the name of uh, John Watson, was a part-time student at the university. While he was also assembly line worker and had been assembly line worker, now he's really a full-time organizer for, this, for the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. And so the, news, the, the um, university had a daily newspaper paid for by state funds, by money from the government, because it was a state university. <clears throat> And the people who ran the newspaper were elected by the students. So what did John do? He ran for, you know, to be editor of the newspaper. And he was elected editor of the newspaper. So what that did then was it gave a tool to the League of Revolutionary Black Workers to have a newspaper paid for by the state of Michigan, right, which they could legally distribute around the campus, and then legally again come and collect the newspapers and take them to the factory. So in fact, they had a new tool to use. And, and this was a form of, of gathering power, and for some period of time, until they got trouble over an article that was written that was kind of pro-Palestine and there was some criticism about them, you know, being kind of questionably in terms of taking sides in the dispute in the Middle East over Israel and Palestine, they were able to run this newspaper and use it for their purposes. So that's another example. And I could, give, I could probably give quite a number of more examples, but I'll, I'll stop there and just tell you uh, a, a couple more things about the, this organization. Uh, <clears throat> I, I say on, there are four levels to, to think about. How are we doing? There are four levels to think about in terms of the overall perception and organizational strategy of this, of this organization, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. One is a historical perspective. On, and on a historical basis, they are along a relatively long line in the 20th century of uh, workers' organizations starting with the uh, in industrial workers of the world, which is now a little bit over 100 years old, to form beyond particular uh, union, a particular uh, industry, but to, to organize broadly a working class. Uh, and that's, that's a, a very important aspect of what they did. Secondly, there's a theoretical aspect. As soon as they began organizing, and the organizations really started with a wildcat strike, and then out of the wildcat strike through, through some protests, and then around that they decided to organize in one factory, and then they went to a second factory, into a many, many fa number of factories, then they went to community places, they went beyond Detroit to places like Atlanta, New York, and so on, and Newark. <clears throat> but they understood that if they were going to make a revolution, they had to know something about revolution. So they understood that they, they also needed to study. They also needed to read. And so they, they sought out courses, classes, books that they could read about uh, revolutionary theory and revolutionary experience. So they wanted to read, and they began to read Marx and Lenin. And I'm going to read you one little passage that I just got uh, last week before I came to uh, Paris 
from one of the still living leaders, original leaders of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, which talks about this origin. So they, they were interested in the theory. In order to have revolutionary practice, you need to have revolutionary theory. They started with practice, but they turned to theory to say we need to build, have a, our vision needs to be in, infused with an understanding of where it comes from historically and where it's going. What is really, if we are opposed to capitalism, what does that mean? If we want to create an alternative society, what is that going to look like? And so on. Uh, thirdly, I gave you some examples of the kind of politics or political dimension that they were uh, involved in. And in terms of a number of different areas of strategy, there was a legal defense, there was self-defense, there was organizing in the factories, there was organizing in the communities, there was outreach to white organizations, outreach beyond Detroit, and a variety of different strategies all tied together into this one uh, overall uh, organization or umbrella group. And, ult and lastly is the cultural dimension which I've talked about too, which is, has a particular resonance in place like Detroit. Because Detroit in some ways is, is a city where uh, cultural phenomena resonate. In some ways, in other places in the US, it's not quite the same as this. An example of this is at this time in Detroit, there was a poet laureate, a named by the city, the uh, top poet or the uh, most important poet of the year in Detroit. It was an African American named Dudley Randall. And it was probably at this time, I think it actually was, the only city in the country that actually named a poet laureate. And I believe at that time, the US did not also did not name a poet laureate, which they now do. But Detroit had a long history of this. And a long history of, of socialist and anarchist and other kinds of left-wing uh, activity, as well as a lot of right-wing activity, a lot of, a lot of protest and, and uh, movement as right from the right as well as from the left. <clears throat> well, one little story I like to tell is this, all, with all of this as background, is that Detroit is kind of everybody's in some way, if you say Detroit, it becomes an interesting thing. Maybe most people have never heard of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, uh, but they've heard of Chrysler and they've heard of Ford and they've heard of General Motors pretty much anywhere in the world nowadays. And they've heard of Detroit. So Detroit resonates as somehow very important. And one of the things I like to say, and this, this story fits very much into the middle of this, uh, is that De Detroit was a city that created the automobile. And in some ways I say, well, Detroit created the automobile, built the automobile so that they could drive it in Los Angeles, right? But also Detroit created the suburbs. And beginning is right after, very shortly after World War II, you have the movement of the suburbs, which, uh, and the movement of the creation of shopping malls, the creation of, of, of highways to the suburbs, which used the automobiles, and which also began the division between the white population and the black population, and in fact helped to, to sustain and in fact increase the tendencies towards segregation and discrimination that exist in the United States and elsewhere. And certainly this is, this is part of the Detroit story. And nowadays, you're hearing again that Detroit is on the map. People are interested in Detroit because maybe it's going to be reborn again, and you know, in America, you know, if you're if you're popular in America, sometimes you only last ten minutes or two seconds, and you get a flash on TV and it's gone. Well, uh, Detroit is, has gone up and gone down, and perhaps there's a there's a new tendency for it to rise again or to get re renovated again or reconstructed again, and. And that's a phenomenon that we need to look at, particularly if we look at what's happening nowadays with, ish, with phenomena like uh, called Black Lives Matter. And in Detroit, they say things like not only Black Lives Matter, but class matters, social class. And so this, this is a way of thinking about this in a way which is really very much part of the American story and the story of you know, basically the Western world, which we're looking at, the immigrant story. And now what I, what I want to do is, before I can save some time for some questions, is I want to give you a few examples of some of what the Detroiters have, have said. <clears throat> 
and what we've said as the writers of this. Uh, first off, one of the, the co-founder of DRUM, the Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement, uh, and the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, and still uh, not too much of a, too good of a health uh, at the present time, but still hanging on, is a guy named Mike Hamlin, who you read about in the book as well. And he sent me this, about a week or so ago, he sent me this statement about the legacy of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers and the meaning for today, and I just wanted to read that to you. He said, <clears throat> The development of the revolutionary black workers is relevant to today's world because it provides a model for how workers using the principles of Marx and Lenin can build a powerful revolutionary organization to combat the evils of the capitalist system. Our strategy for mobilization of the working class was based upon Lenin's pamphlet, What is to be Done, which applies most any place in the world where there is a need to organize for revolution. The League began with a newspaper ba based on Lenin's presentation. It grew with people from all classes who flocked to us based on the horrors of the American economy, the intensified oppression of blacks in the workplace, and our commitment to revolutionary struggle. We stressed Marxist education and the strategies and tactics of successful revolutions in the colonial nations of the 50s and 60s. We achieved significant victories such as forcing the United Auto Workers in 1968 to change its policy of excluding blacks from leadership posts. Likewise, we had similar success with management that resulted in significant changes in working conditions in the auto industry and other corporations. We were also successful in raising the political consciousness of a broad array of workers, students, and intellectuals who supported our work. Some of our mistakes were, and there were mistakes, and I haven't gotten into that part of it, but I'll just mention what Mike says, and it's pretty, I think it's pretty accurate. Number one, not anticipating the push for ultra-democracy in an organization that held very sensitive secrets. Two, the difficulty in maintaining discipline among our Olympian proletariat elements that had a role in what we did. And three, not understanding that male chauvinism was rampant and brutal. These are mistakes others can learn from. And certainly those are mistakes which were very much a part of the period of the 60s. Uh, if you look at most of the, particularly you can look at the white uh, organizations, but certainly among the black organizations, what you find is there tended to be uh, male domination, there tended to be uh, uh, discrimination among between the, the African-American women and the uh, white women and so there was a number of issues that were constantly all the organizations faced these issues at this particular period of time <clears throat> please express my gratitude to the brothers sisters and comrades that are carrying on the struggle throughout the world fight our enemies relentlessly fight until victory the struggle continues we will win Mike Hamlin co-founder of DRUM and the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. I think it's a, it's a pretty, pretty awesome statement. Uh, and uh, I also want to tell you, to show you how things have changed, and this, this, the research was done on this in the late 60s and early 70s. The book was published first in 1975. I predict most of you or many of you were not even born at that particular period of time. I was around, but probably most of you were not around. But, and, it's, and it's around and it's still, you know, people are still looking at it. But I just wanted to give you a sense of how uh, my co-author Dan and I, how we uh, encapsulated what this was about at the various different phases. So let me just give you three little short pieces to, that I'll read to you here. Uh, let me see which ones they are. Yeah. The first edition in 1975, we said the following. <clears throat> the decade of the 1960s, with its assassinations, protests, riots, war, and violence, has given birth to a decade that is deceptively quiet on the surface. While the forces of change move even more certainly toward the taproots of American society, popular doubt about the ability of the dominant class to govern effectively 
has become increasingly widespread in the wake of the energy crisis, corruption in the highest elective office, and malicious corporate intrigues. The system, it sounds like today, right, nowadays. Well, you'll see what happens in the third version. The system no longer produces what was once touted as, quote, the highest standard of living on earth, unquote. The people of the city of Detroit have been dealing with the crisis of power in a dramatic fashion, sometimes emphasizing race, sometimes emphasizing class, sometimes seized by fear and sometimes with vision. This book is about their experiences, a history of the contemporary United States in microcosm, an exemplary case of a social condition and conflicting social visions which stretch from when, at one end of America to the other. Then in 1998, just down the road a piece here, uh, we said the following. <clears throat> in our view, the nation is being herded in exactly the wrong direction. We need more socializing resources rather than more privatizing a more rigorous progressive income tax rather than regressive flat taxes or payroll taxes, increased health and social security coverage rather than restrictions enforced by higher fees and means testing. Uh, we go on. In the 1960s, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers was part of a massive political movement that took up that challenge. The League put its finger on all the hot buttons and had the courage to push them. Many of the strategies advanced by the League remained viable or could be adopted to address current conditions. It understood that mistreated groups must organize independently or get redress, to get redress for their grievances. The League did not exist long enough to shape the means to realize their needs within the broader class context they also advocated. That organizational task remains, and it still remains. But the League understood that problems would not be solved until their root causes were defined. It further understood that any direct challenge to the economic elites must be accompanied by an assault on the cultural institutions that promote their interests. Walmart, Coca-Cola, etc. cetera. Uh, and we conclude this section with, soon Detroit will be celebrating its 300th birthday an event that is generating considerable enthusiasm in the city and even some hope that real renewal might at last be at hand. Detroit has served as a metaphor for much that is wrong in America during the second half of the 20th century, just as it once served as a metaphor for much that was positive in America in the first half of the 20th century. But Detroit is much more than a metaphor. Detroit is a real place where real people live. And throughout this nation, Americans living in numerous cities and regions are facing the same problems that have beset Detroit. Like the Detroiters we have written about, these Americans do not mind working, but they definitely do mind dying. And one more, please, in the 2012 edition, the third edition, I don't know about the French edition, but the third edition, we said the following. The crisis that Detroit confronted in the 1960s is now painfully evident on a national scale, as I would say on an international scale. The racial temperament of America is certainly not what it was four decades ago. A considerable number of African Americans now have opportunities they were denied their parents and grandparents. African American political power is a reality, and we have seen the election of an African American president of the United States. Nonetheless the, increased, uh, nonetheless, the income gap with other ethnic groups, the average lifespan, the poverty rate, the incarceration rate, and other indicators of well-being for African Americans are now no better and often worse, and often much worse, than they were 40 years ago. More generally, all Americans now face a future in which their standard of living is in gradual but steady decline. Countless commentaries have forecast the death of the American middle class. Mass media speak openly about a permanent army of the unemployed, even though they do not use that term. 
The American public school system, once the pride of the nation, crumbles while the power elite would have the public believe that the solution is cutting the pay and number of teachers and possibly privatizing education altogether. The money required to maintain a thousand overseas military bases, did I say a thousand? Yeah, uh, maybe it's not quite a thousand, uh, is always reliable, available, but funds are always lacking to address the decaying American infrastructure whose deterioration is only fleetingly visible when a bridge collapses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then it goes on, of course, of uh, healthcare declining and so on and so on. As we observed in the preface to the second edition, and then of course they say, we don't mind working, but we do mind dying. Well, uh, I think I'll stop there and give you all an opportunity to think about it a little bit, to ask some questions, to make some comments, and I'd be glad to take your, you know, have a discussion with you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> you said that Detroit was a place, of all places, where uh, African-American movements uh, and other 60s movements merged, and you said that women's movements were uh, alive and kicking in Detroit. What was the place and role of women within the League of Revolutionary Black Workers? You said that Mike Hamelin mentioned male chauvinism, yeah. but could you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, well, I'm gonna do a preface to it because it was an area that, I, that you kind of hinted at here and that maybe I forgot in my original statements. But I wanted to just say a, a little bit about it and I'll get to the women's issue in a moment with this. Uh, but to say that among the black movements in the 60s in the United States, uh, I identified four major movements, and one of these was the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, which I identify as the only one which was actually led by and supported by and carrying out a strategy which was a, a worker strategy. Not just a black strategy, but a worker strategy. The other movements, such as the Black Muslims, who were also in Detroit, the Black Panthers, who started in the Bay Area in California and Oakland in that area and eventually moved east. They were in Chicago. Uh, Fred Hampton, Mark Clark were killed by the police in Chicago and eventually came to Detroit and uh, had some, didn't have excessive influence there because the Detroiters who, who wanted to maintain their strategy of being a workers movement and not a black nationalist or strictly a black power movement, uh, really they, they did their best to uh, embraced the Panthers by taking over the organization, by becoming the Black Panthers, as opposed to letting Black Panthers from outside run, the, run their own organization. And lastly, there was the Civil Rights Movement, which also came to Detroit because the, the organization, uh, which was perhaps a, a little bit more radical and a little bit more uh, youth-oriented and a little less uh, church-oriented than Martin Luther King's movement, was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which originally was, was seated in Atlanta, and eventually moved to New York. And uh, one of the leaders of that movement was invited to come to Detroit and actually join the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. And that was a man named Black Foreman who's written a number of books about black nationalism and black power and black revolution. So there were all these tendencies at the same time, and somewhere they all focused on Detroit. And if you know about the student movements of the 60s, there was the student uh, uh, SDS, Students for D uh, Democratic Society, which was started in part as a, uh, a movement against the war in Vietnam. And they started, they had their original statement of intention and, and organizational strategy was started in Port Huron, very close to the city of Detroit, not just outside of Detroit, not far from Detroit. And what you find at this time is that in, in virtually all these movements, uh, we're, we're talking about a period that wasn't a long time in growing out of the uh, post-World War II period, the relatively quiet Eisenhower years of the 50s, and coming into the 60s, and there was still a real, not a really developed strategy, a new strategy of women independence, 
of women uh, equality. It was beginning to emerge at this, at this period of time. And what you found, and this was particularly true, I think I mentioned, is in, in the black organizations, it was true in the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, that women were, were generally active in the, in, in, the, in the factories, women were working in the factories, women were abused and discriminated against in the factories, not just because they were black, but often because they were women. Uh, and the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, as one organization, had a six-man uh, uh, executive committee, and it was all male. And at one time, the women who were married to these men were also active and were involved in organizational strategy, but were not on the first plane of uh, power within the, within the organization. In addition to that, uh, at often, in, in a number of different cases, uh, the black men also were involved, sometimes married, sometimes not married to black women, were involved with white women, and uh, sexually and uh, intimately involved, and sometimes married to white women. So there was this, there was this mixture of phenomena. And if you look from institution, from, uh, yeah, institution to institution, or organization to organization, you will see a particular phenomenon of uh, uh, male domination which took place. And, well, just an example, the Black Panthers, one of the uh, strategies that they uh, put forward for some period of time, and this was, I think, pretty much true in the Black Muslims too, was uh, make babies for the revolution. So there was, a move, there, was a, there was a sense in which women were not considered to be on the same level, the same plane, in, as organizers, as leaders, as thinkers, as activists, as were the, as were the men. And often they, there was just another form of discrimination. So this, is, this definitely was part of the period. And, and Mike, who's African American, who <coughs> came up as an assembly line worker, Eventually, he had, a, he had, beyond the league, he had a career and he was an educator for the United Auto Workers uh, Union. And he's been married for some, uh, probably well over 40 years, I can't imagine exactly how long he's been married, to an Irish-American white woman. And so this is, this is also the, the racial uh, extre extremities were breaking down in some ways, but still in all, the overall picture was at that particular time, if you're going to do a criticism, you'd say, where were the women? How come the women were acknowledged? How come the women weren't equal to the men? If you were really building a revolution, what was the role of women? And it was no question that this, at this, this period, this was a clear cut uh, form of discrimination as well as discrimination on the, in the uh, uh, institutional level, in the factories and so on. <clears throat> and if, if you look at the movie, uh, Finally Got the News, you will see this. You will see the, 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 uh, the black men taking the lead, and you will see, you, you will see the women somewhat in, in the background protesting, demonstrating, and so on, but not on the first, not on the first plane. Uh, there, there are a number of films written about the written about the assembly line. Michael Moore did a film, uh, and there were several films that were written and uh, made. And and in the last couple of years, there have been a number of films that have come out about Detroit. But this particular one is the only one that, that really deals with the history of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, called Finally Got the News. And one thing that's that's really quite uh, special about that film is I say two things are. There's a seven minute montage at the beginning of that film, which is the history of, um, uh, from slavery through civil rights. Uh, in a seven minute period, it shows you what has happened to uh, the, the black population in the United States. And then from there, it jumps into, you know, I don't mind working, but I do mind dying. And this struggle with the factories and the unions and the power structure of the country. So it does that. Uh, the second thing that it does is that it, uh, it, it really show, has some very uh, useful and, and uh, incredible footage of working on the assembly line itself. So you actually see the workers on the assembly line, both black and white workers. Um, 
And I remember um, several years ago, I saw a screening of the movie The Weather Underground, and, and Bill Ayers was here. Uh, from, sure. from Yeah, he was here in France speaking about his experiences in The Weather Underground in the 1960s. And something that, that was interesting, I thought, was the way he expressed uh, revolutionary consciousness. What he said was that we actually believed that revolution was possible. And we really believed that. And, and he, he kept emphasizing that. And I, I thought it was, he was kind of trying to build a bridge to, to our generation, or to their generation. Uh, I'm somewhere in between. Uh, a generation that has a hard time understanding that idea, you know, that this idea that to live in, in a moment, in a political culture, where the idea of revolution is actually considered to be possible. And so you talked a lot about revolutionary consciousness among the auto workers of Detroit. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what that, mean, what that meant, to, to actually believe uh, that a revolution was, was possible and, and necessary. I studied uh, one of your French philosophers a long time ago, I did a, a dissertation on uh, Merleau Ponty. And somewhere in, in Merleau, does everybody know Merleau Ponty? Ever heard of him? And somewhere along the way, Merleau Ponty has a very interesting footnote about working class. And he says, he says the, the way to identify the working class, or the way the working class identifies, can identify itself, is that you get up every morning and you, you get brush your teeth, and you, you drink your coffee or whatever, you say goodbyes, whoever you say goodbye to, and you go to work. And the next morning, you get up in the morning, and you go to work. And you go to work. And so you go to work, you are in fact acting out the role of what a worker does. And that's what these people started with experiencing. They were not in the street. They were homeowners, many of them. They had worked, uh, 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 had some of them were skilled workers. They had worked for a long time. They had uh, some of the values of upward mobility, which certainly existed in the post-World War II period in America. And they actually, uh, they actually understood that this is what their life was about. And what they did like was they didn't like being discriminated against. They didn't like being unequal. They didn't like like the fat cats got all the rich stuff and they had to work real hard and then were forced to work overtime and things of that sort. And so they began to say, well, what is this all about? What are we working for? Well then, if you take that experience and you take and you start reading a couple of books and the books say, ah, at the point of production, if you own the production, it's very different than if you don't own it. Somebody else owns the production. It changes the whole structure. And so if the structure is geared against you, you never can get ahead because you never own what you produce, then one way to deal with it is to change the ownership. If you th and you think about that, you say, well, this is what I'm supposed to do as a worker. I'm supposed to have the benefit of what I produce. And if I don't, well, there's the definition of revolution. There's the definition of working class, and there's the definition of revolution. Whether you're an immigrant, or whether you're black, or whether you're male, or whether you're female, or whether you're in, in, in the auto factory, or whether you're a steel producer, or in the mines, you can make that uh, uh, conclusion based on experience and knowledge and information. And it's a question of consciousness and awareness. And so if people are saying, duh, I don't know what's going on, or I don't know why I feel this way, or I don't know why they're doing this to me, and you say, okay, well, read this. Re look at this. How do you feel when the foreman says, you gotta stay at the job, and you can't go home and take care of your sick mom? And you begin to put two and two together. And in a particular social context, this adds up to a movement in which be, a number of people begin to share a sense of values, a sense of an attitude towards what's dominating them and towards a perception of how they could see change. And the 60s happens to be, not only in the United States, but in Cuba, in Mexico, in uh, France, in a number of places, a particular uh, moment in which people really believe. Like I can certainly sympathize, I can see that Bill Ayers could come here and he could say, way back then, he might not say he believes it now, but he might say, way back, we really believe this. And whether it be the, the, the black power movement led by the 
black nas uh, nationalists like the black Muslims who were carrying out this a strategy of power for the black people who, who had been denied. Uh, behind it was a similar sentiment. And the sentiment was beginning to be connected to a movement. And the movement was beginning to be connected to an organization. And the organization was cross-fertilizing. So when I say in the state of Michigan, around Detroit, you had this, this tendency to kind of interact the, the array of different movements at the same time, you have a center which is ready to explode. And it was very explosive, these wildcat strikes and this form of organization in and out of the factories was very extensive for a relatively short period of time. And it echoed in Torino, and it echoed in Newark, New Jersey, and it echoed, echoed in New York, and it echoed in a variety of different places, and it took different forms. And so yes, I think, I understand completely that they would say like this. And so each organization with their own perspective said, we're building a revolution. This is our sense of what it could be like. But there was, um, I'll see you in the back. Said that at some point that they, their goal was revolution. So my question was, what revolution? Did they want to change the, the whole society? Uh, did they want to, uh, or were they uh, interested only in their, their work or their community? Were they interested, maybe you said something about that, sorry if you did, but were they interested in the white community? Do they want to change the organization of society? Or, and, and the other thing is about theory. You said that they had theoretic, uh, theoretical basis that they started to read. So obviously they were Marxists, right? But did they have any other references or other models? Uh, what what model, uh, of models did they follow? Well, you know, very quickly, you know, we're talking about the late 60s and there's, there's Mao Zedong in China and there's, uh, 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 you know, uh, Dini in, in Paris and there's, lots of, and there's the, the Cuban revolutionaries and there's, so there's lots of different people who are espousing some sense of revolution. What, basically, what, if, you, if you look at them as a workers' movement, Basically, and I think Mike Hamlin pretty much says this in, in, the, in the piece that I quoted from him. I mean, he's saying this today, and he's pretty much saying the same thing. He's saying, what we're interested in is combating, uh, build a powerful revolutionary organization to combat the evils of the capitalist system. So basically what they're saying, through reform and, and social change on a broad base of levels, whether it be cultural levels, whether it be political levels, whether it be in the union, in the factories, in the city, in the government, right? What we want to do is we want to have more workers' power, black power, and then through that move towards a greater control of the resources of, of, uh, of our society that we built. And so there's no, there's no blueprint of revolution. No, 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 they were looking. Well, yeah, I mean, eventually, <coughs> as, the, as the organizations begin to divide and split, because there's so many at this time, in the late 60s, there's so many different influences that are coming from many places, such as from China, and such as from the Soviet Union in some ways, and from uh, uh, Prague and from other places. It begins to divide, and there's a tendency which then becomes pro-Maoist. And there's a tendency which becomes anti-Maoist. And there's a, there's a tendency to say, we don't want to have a, a, a Leninist uh, centralized organization. We want to have a decentralized organization. And so the, there are all of these tendencies which are never really fully clarified. And they very quickly lead to a number of divisions in, in the organization. Because at the time, with relatively little resources, building a big base, right? There wasn't, there wasn't the time over a course of three or four years, which I've indicated, there's not the time or the human power or the theoretical understanding or the practical experience even to really build any kind of like a, a blueprint of, okay, this is all the things that are wrong with the capitalist system and this is what the new, the new society is gonna look like. So there's no, there's no blueprint modeled out. Fortunately or unfortunately, and if you read Marx, you could say, well, does Marx have a blueprint? Well, no, really a blueprint, right? But if you understand the difference of controlling or not controlling the point of production, 
And if you looked at it in today's terms, you would also say, what's well, quite different? Because what, what is the point of production? Many of these factories are closed down and are really probably not going to open up again, so that the working conditions become very transformed. The kind of organizing that's going on today uh, in the United States, for instance, there's lots of new organizing and new unions being formed. But they're, generally speaking, they've died down or they've, they've lessened the influence and number of members in organizations like uh, auto workers. Uh, but in new areas of employment, like part-time employment, uh, for, uh, in areas like fast food employment, in university employment of a variety of types of faculty, student employment in universities. These, or, these areas are now beginning to organize. So there's a lot of new organization going on. But it's very different in terms of understanding what the point of production is and what it means to be a worker. And then also what it means then to organize. What are you trying to achieve? So it changes. It's changed a lot now. But still, this is a historical example of a particular set of events at a particular time. <clears throat> Kathy. I think there was like underestimation of what they were confronting. And I think that there's a whole history of this. I, I've worked with lots and lots of really creative, brilliant organizations and organizers. I, I worked with, you know, I worked with the left in the underground in Chile. Um, so I know really good organizers. But we've constantly underestimated the forces we've, we've confronted. And, and the movement I worked with in Chile actually toppled Pinochet, so there was a victory. But if you look at what they did during Allende, totally naive, completely unprepared. And I think that there was a history in the United States of really creative, brilliant organizers. You could say the late 30s, early 40s, because the early civil rights movement was very much geared around labor rights. They understood the issue as exploitation. The Popular Front was in, involved in civil rights, and they were smashed. They were completely smashed. And then again in the 60s, they're absolutely naive in the 60s. They're completely sure that they're going to win. And you know they have these victories in courtrooms, which just convinces the right that you need mandatory sentences and taking the power away from judges and juries. And you have, you know, so I, I think what we don't have is an understanding of how to win. You know, we have lots of these, like, Pyrrhic victories and then smashed. And I'm, 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 I'm thinking that a lot of the demobilization right now is that frustration of feeling, how do we win this thing? You know, there's been a whole history of really brilliant organizers and organizations. They've, they've done a lot of really wonderful, brilliant things, and they've been defeated time and time again. Um, so I was saying, I, I worked with the underground in Chile. Those guys were brilliant. They even defeated Pinochet. But they never, never are, they, ne they always have everything balanced against them. So in the 60s in particular, there was a complete naivete about the forces they were facing. If you looked at it in Latin America, they got really brutally smashed. But in the US, they got smashed too. So if you won in the courtroom, fine. You won in the courtroom with judges and juries, so the right took the right judges and juries away from us with mandatory sentences. And I think that there has been a whole you know, history of, there was an pe earlier period in the United States, late 30s, early 40s, civil rights movement, understood the problem as a problem of exploitation. The Popular Front all under, you know, put civil rights as a, as a priority. So fighting about understanding the relationship between race and class, understanding um, ways of mobilizing people, doing really creative forms of mobilization, there's been a long history of this. It's just that we're always smashed. And so what we're really looking at right now is saying, you know, what do we do to win? Because uh, I have a, I have a friend I argue with this uh, all the time, and he says he's a, he's a very simple analysis basically. He says the top dogs always win. He says they know what to do, they uh, own what to do it with, and they don't lose, right? And if they need to make an adjustment, like Kathy's suggesting, so they'll have mandatory sentencing instead of letting these guys get off, 
like they let James Johnson get off, right? Uh, we won't let that kind of mistake happen again. Well, it's, pro it's possible they won't let that kind of mistake, or they won't let them run the newspaper, which they didn't let, they didn't let them run the, the student newspaper forever. They, they put a couple of articles which uh, uh, attacked a few uh, interests, and boom, they, were, they lost the position. Uh, so that's one way to look at it. The top dogs win. There is no way beyond it. You can have reforms, you can have participation, you can vote, you can do a lot of things, but you can't really change anything. Unless, unless the top dogs say, let's change, because they need to change, or because they think it's really in their interest to change. So if it's not in their interest, there won't be change. Okay, my sense of, of giving you this report today is to say, let's look at the historical example. If there is some examples of people who do develop a vision and a strategy to bring about change, where you call it really revolution or you don't call it revolution, then it's worth acknowledging. It's worth saying, gee, these people really did something. And if we could do something like that, at least we will have achieved something and maybe we'll be on the road to make change. Because in reality, one way to turn your, your statement around and your question around is to say, we don't know yet. We could say, my, my friend is right, the top dogs always win. We could say, we don't know yet. They've won up to now, but maybe they're not going to win this time around because conditions are different and the situation is different. And people are really, I mean, in France, what I see in France, what I saw the last week in Belgium, and what I see in the United States, and certainly what I see in Detroit, and what I see in New York, is, uh, because I live in New York, is I see that people are really stretched out and, it, and it's, things are not good and things are in some ways getting continuously and increasingly worse. And when that happens, well, then there, poss there is the possibility of some kind of new form of social effort to bring about some change in some form or another. You have your hand in the back there. Yes, I would just, maybe through violence and just putting down every form of organization and building something new, getting back from the beginning, going back to the beginning. Well, well uh, uh, Ayers and the Weather Underground, they were uh, advocates of violence for a period of time and uh, they blew up one building and maybe a few others and uh, many of them went in hiding, many of them went to jail. Uh, certainly if you look at the Black Panthers as an example, because you can do historical examples and say where did violence work and how was violence used and whether something like Martin Luther King's nonviolence or uh, you know, Mahatma Gandhi's nonviolence is a better way to reach, to reach change. I don't know. But you could see, certainly see that something like the, back, the, it, the, the, the leading people of the legal revolutionary black workers, none of them got killed during the period when they were actively organizing and uh, being militant organizing. The experience of the black work, Planet Panthers was very much the opposite. Many of them got killed and went to jail for a long period of time because they did carry guns around. And they did say, they did in a way advocate violence. So it depends on where you are and where you think the violence and what kind of violence. No, but I'm not thinking about this civil war because this is some, these are some isolated cases. But um, as you were saying, I think that the only way would be to let people, the people who govern, change things when they want to, or just pure extreme violence that would. <laughs> get everything down. And that's the thing, like we, I think sometimes I get to think that the only way to let things go and let things change when they have to, because this would mean ending, putting an end to everything in some way. Well, you know, one thing which I really didn't emphasize very much, and I would like to sort of give the counter point of view of this, is that I did say, give a couple of examples, of statements of saying that, you know, there has been some, you know, progressive social change in America. And I'm just specifically talking about the United States now. I'm not talking about Canada or, or Europe, but the United States. You could see that there have been some efforts to bring, to bring change within the existing system, with the existing power elite and power structure. Uh, and so there were many gains. In fact, Part of the movement of the 60s was created 
because the gains that were made by union organizing and by militancy, not in the 30s and in the 40s and in the 50s, led to a, a number of, of gains and successes. So there was more union organizing, there was higher salaries, there was higher wages. The workers in, in the assembly line uh, were, many of them were homeowners and did own, were car owners and they could afford to send their children to university to have an education. But on the other hand, they were still under the gun and they were still oppressed and discriminated against and not in an equal plane with the people who were, owned, the, owned the factories and, and, ran the, and ran the government. So there are these different dimensions of looking at this problem too. And what you need to do, I think, is you need to, in, in order to put forward an argument, is suggest how is, what, what this would look like. Because you know, there are people that have written about revolutionary violence, right? including in France. And, and then you can say, well, what is it? What does it look like? How does it work? How is it going to bring about change? And what's going to be the, the uh, counter reaction of the government, which seems to have most of the sources of, of violence to begin with, and uses it most of the time. some way to think that we've, uh, we've achieved something. And every time we achieve something, we want, to, we want more, because we realize that underneath every <laughs> beautiful things and all the things written, there's always something that's not, that's still not all right. Like, even when things seem to change in the law, the way people think is still not all right, something like that. And, I've thought about it a lot, I've, dis I've discussed about it with people and what, <laughs> and what we were thinking about is that just maybe we, we should go from one civilization to, to another, like, I don't know, the end of the... Listen, I mean, because I spent a lot of time in Latin America. The Argentines used violence, 30,000 disappeared, the Chileans mostly did it didn't matter, thousands, you know, 3,000 disappeared, a lot less than Argentina that used violence. I mean, if you looked around in the 60s, people used all kinds of forms, and they were really destroyed, you including know. Violence. Including violence. And in fact, the ones that used violence were more devastated than the ones that didn't. It wasn't a victory. It, you're, you're fighting a, a government that has military force that you don't have. It's suicide. Read this book <laughs> in French or in English. You can read it. I, you know, I don't know any of the, it's not written in any of the languages, but you can read it in those two languages. And then, and when you read it, then let me know. I'll be glad to have a dialogue with you. And I'm sure, I'm sure these professors here would also be glad, and the other students would be glad to have a dialogue with you. Right? But before you, before you pick up a gun and, and go out to Place de Sorbonne, uh, <laughs> maybe think about it a little bit. You know, I, I, I don't know very, that very much about what's going on with the police in France. I've always perceived that the police in France were particularly nasty. Uh, but I could tell you what's going on in the United States. And they really are militarized. They do have uh, guns and they do have uh, 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 tanks and they do have drones in even very, very small towns. They have this stuff. And, they are, and, their, and their training is military. And one of the reasons why so many black people, both male and female, have been killed lately is because the police no longer shoot people in the leg. That's, that's the past. They shoot in the chest or they shoot in the head, directly. So, because if, if, if you look at any of the people who've been killed, you say, where were they shot? Well, they were either shot in the chest or shot in the head. And very few have wounds in the leg or in the arm. And they used to do that. Because you could stop somebody, even if they have a gun, you could stop them by, by wounding them. But no, they shoot to kill. So this is a, this is a highly military structure. And so you have to think about that. In the, in the back, you have a... Yeah. Channels of politics, we don't seem to be accomplishing anything. And I mean, one could, um, in agreement with Kathy and with, with, with you, of course, um, as well, 
but I mean, one could argue, for example, that carefully deployed forms of what, say, uh, Michael Katz called civil disorder, you know, not violence in terms of taking up arms and going out and killing people, but in terms of what happened in Baltimore, for example, uh, in, in what happened in Ferguson, uh, you know, do these forms of violence draw the kind of attention that's needed to these issues, you know, without this kind of civil violence, I mean, perhaps there wouldn't be as much attention to the issue of police brutality in the United States and, and that there is. And granted, not a lot of substantial changes have occurred, but that's another problem on some level. Uh, well, you said these forms of violence. Did you really mean these forms of protest? Yeah, protest. protest. Yeah, which basically are nonviolent. We're non I mean, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers was basically nonviolent. They weren't into carrying guns. They, they never, you never saw any of them dressed in a military fashion or carrying guns or uh, doing things like that. They didn't espouse a theory of nonviolence, but they didn't practice a theory of violence. They didn't say, we have to go and shoot these guys in order to make change. They said, we have to protest, we have to organize. You know, uh, we, have to, we have to do elections in the union, we have to do elections in the city. Ken Cockrell was a candidate for mayor. He was elected to the city council. They believed that those, those reformed successes could ultimately lead to a much broader, broader sense of change. Well, and, you know, Kathy, professor here, is, is questioning whether it ever happens that way, whether it really c c comes out that way. Oh, you could, you know, and we're not talking about, you know, the revolutions of the 20th century, you could say, are long gone whether it's the Chinese or the Mexican or the Cuban Revolution, is a long gone phenomena, and we're in a very different state, stage now of, of historical development. <clears throat> um, okay, so I can actually say that you can't win. I think that we haven't won, and that we have to be careful about being naive about forms of struggle. But um, I do think that riots get attention, but I don't think they're a long-term strategy. But they certainly did put the issue on the map when it wasn't, um, when nonviolent organizers didn't. I mean, I guess if I was going to choose a theorist of change that I think is most convincing, it would be Gramsci, because he came out of defeat. And he analyzed why they were defeated. And he understood that change has to come about through long-term ideological and cultural change. And that's like a very slow, long-term strategy thinking that the right has mastered. They really got, they use that strategy. And we have to. Well, I mean, I, I, what I propose with, the, with this, the Detroit story is that in some ways they have. They have, they have understood that there's a relationship between politics and culture. Music matters, right, as black lives matter. And uh, writing newspapers and you know, getting people to read them matters. And reading books matter. And that uh, you know, education is a way of raising uh, social consciousness and of, raising, of, of creating class consciousness. And you know, America is a very, very peculiar place in terms of very, very different from Europe in talking about social class to begin with. In America, it's very, very difficult and has been for a long time to even say there are social classes. People say that everybody's middle class. Right? And what, the, the newest thing, I, which I, I thought of it the other day, because I was uh, listening to a very strong pro-African-American talk by one of our senators who's become a leading figure, uh, Senator Warren, who's a female, and possibly was mentioned as a possible candidate for president, and she gave this very, very strong speech. You know, we have to have equality. There's all this inequality and all this discrimination and all this racial tension. We must get beyond it. There must be a movement. There must be social change in this direction. It's very strong. For a U.S. senator to stand up in a public place in 2015 and to say that is unheard of. Well, Bernie Sanders says something like that, but still, it's a pretty strong thing. On the other hand, what I heard her say repeatedly, she never once said the word social class. She never once said the word working class. You can hardly not say working class in America. 
So to say working class is already, it's kind of, you know, at least in terms of linguistically, it's pretty revolutionary in America, because sociology has tried for many, many years to convince us that we are post-class structure, post, and Obama has tried to convince us we're post-racial. So in the post-industrial, post-class, post-racial society, how do, you, how do you say this thing? So what does Senator Warren say repeatedly? She says, what is the current uh, popular form of describing what relatively uh, poor people, uh, people who are now losing their homes and losing their jobs and so on, should do. And they're called working families. So you should get used to the term, if you want to read about American civilization, what the meaning of working families is. And it's code. It's a code concept, like many other concepts. Which it, it's, it's a way of saying working class without saying working class. It's a way of saying working class mi dash middle class, but you don't want to say these are working class or these are middle class, so they become working families. It's also a code for what happens to two, to two family incomes. Because if you, because not two family, but two person incomes in a family. Because if you don't have two incomes, you don't pay the rent. Right? So you have to have working families. So it's a code for a, a, an ideological concept of what American society is supposed to be like, which of course it's not in reality, because it's, it's, it's becoming, you know, it's declining in those ways in which working families, whether they be working class or whether they be middle class, are getting the short end of the stick continuously and more extensively. So it's a very interesting thing. And she is one of the most leftist senators that we, that we have today in America. So that's it. Any more questions or comments? Please, Mr. Good. Well, Bowman. thank you all. all right. Great. Thanks for coming. Sorry about the rain. I tried for, la I've been in France for the last 10 days. I tried to keep the weather like it was, but couldn't do it, sorry. No, I don't mind working. My family working, my family is definitely working class. But I do mind dying.